worship the God who is. We worship the God who all the doors will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God still holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung above that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolled in stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. song that says the joy of the Lord is our strength and in this time we need strength to continue to live and to not have to be in fear but to enjoy what God has allowed us to see. Is that amen? Amen. Next song we'd like to do is your great name. Oh, 
we've been traveling in the, in the Gospel of Luke for the, for the last couple of months as being part of our lectionary reading. And you'll know that Luke wanted to impart a very orderly gospel to us. He was trying to impress upon Theophilus, who was learning um, about what it means to actually be a follower of God. And he wanted to give with absolute certainty this account of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He actually used the word certainty, and as a physician, as a doctor, he was precise in the language that he chooses, and translated as philia, it really means he wanted to impart a stability of ideas or the stability of statements. And so over the last couple of weeks, we have really been listening to these statements that are supposed to bring about certainty in our lives, to, to really speak to the foundation of our faith. That's really what the gospel, according to Luke, has tried to do. And so today we discover that in amongst the certainty is really a struggle and a conversation between life and death, a confrontation of the, the chasms or, or great divides that we face in life, the consequences of our choices, and the many conversations that we have in this life that reflect into eternity. And so we have very clearly a poor man who's given a name, Lazarus. We have a rich man without a name in this story. And we see the story that, that takes us into the agony of poverty and then into, really into the essence of God hearing the cry and the pain of his life, into a place of rested, deep, restful peace and healing and comfort. And then we are forced into scrutinizing this rich man who, who really is suffering. He's literally in flames. He's burning. And, and, and he's desperate to change his fate, and he realizes he cannot. And so he begins to try and negotiate with Abraham, that Abraham sends messengers to his brothers because he doesn't want them to suffer the same kind of fate. And so we come to this passage and, and we have to examine it in the full context of where we are in the Gospel of Luke. But the, the, the central theme of this particular passage is about how we deal with poverty in our lives. We cannot escape that. We have been doing some trips, Helen and myself, and the one trip was to Miami. Okay. And I know some of you do that every day because you work in Miami, like, where, where to go? Um, but we went to Miami. As we came into Miami, we, we were, I'm, I'm not sure which road we took, but we, we were, <laughs> there, there seems to be a number of roads that you can use to get to Miami. But we kind of came off the highway, and as we came off the highway, there, there was a Dunkin' Donuts, as there usually is on any corner. Um, but in the midst of it all, there was a woman. And quite honestly, she, she was using, needing to go to the toilet, to be blunt. And we, it was staggering, because that is staggering, obviously. You know, in the most private places that we go, we close doors, and no one sees us, and we don't even speak about that, heaven forbid. But here was this woman in the midst of everywhere, in a busy intersection. And you looked, I mean, you couldn't escape her. There's just no way you can escape her. And then you see it, like we've all seen it. The pain and the agony and the madness of poverty. And if we cannot sit in that place as Christians, we cannot experience the kingdom of heaven. There is something about the anguish 
of when people have lost everything and have nothing, and there might be a million reasons as to how that happened. But when poverty of any nature creeps in, be it financial or be it spiritual, there is almost a flame that burns you from the inside out. Something diminishes your humanity. And so what Jesus, remember he's just spoken to the Pharisees. I mean, he's really struggling with the Pharisees. He's saying to them, you are not listening. He's just had a confrontation a few minutes earlier, and he says to them, you, you really tell everybody what they must believe. So basically, he's talking to the religious order. You neatly explain to people what they must believe, but you yourselves struggle because your hearts are not right. He then goes on to speak about divorce, and he speaks about infidelity that creates divorce, often. And then, and then he says, he, he, he really impresses upon them, he said, it doesn't matter what you say, God knows your hearts. And then we come to the story. We come to the story that, that is a drastic reversal of what happens to the rich man on earth and the poor Lazarus. We, we are forced to actually taste Lazarus's agony. He couldn't, he imagined what those feasting tables of the rich man looked like, and yet he couldn't have a crumb. And now there is the divide. We know very clearly from the Gospel of Matthew that when Jesus says, and we read it in Matthew chapter 25, when, when Matthew says, you will know that God's presence has been there when you treat the hungry and the sick and the poor and you visit those in prison. There was something about Mary when she was pregnant with Jesus, when she sings that song and she says, the hungry will be full. When Jesus says in Luke's gospel, right early in chapter 4, when he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has called me to preach good news to the poor, to set the captives free. We know that the rich man struggled and Jesus said, well, you will experience the kingdom of heaven if you sell everything. We have no choice on earth but to deal with the way we deal with poverty and our possessions. It's almost as if we hold them in balance. We have no choice in establishing the kingdom of heaven where we do not deal with what we have and what we do not have. And how we treat those who are vulnerable. And so I want to speak about three things this morning. First of all, that there is a great chasm that comes often because of our choices. We see very clearly here that, that at no point in the telling of this parable does Jesus actually say that there is something bad about the rich man. At no point. We make all sorts of assumptions about that because, you know, he's now burning. But there's no point. Does it say there's anything bad about him? All it really says is, is that he seemed to live oblivious about the agony that was around him. And so somehow this parable really draws us to a couple of things. It draws us to our own choices. Our choices around possessions, poverty, and fidelity. I mean, you, you, you can't arrive there without reading those first passages. Because ultimately, it's what's in our hearts. So in other words, we will often find a chasm a great divide, an unbridgeable place when we haven't lived aware of the impact of our choices. There is something about the Christian life that calls us into congruent transparency. What you see is what you get. And is that true? That's really what Jesus keeps confronting in these passages. Is it true what you see is what you get? 
Or is there a secret life behind it all? We are called into a place of deep congruency. We are also reminded that we are known and we are seen and we are heard. Abraham makes it very clear in this conversation between heaven and hell or, or the place that really separates us from, from God that the agony that we experience here will actually be resolved, maybe not on earth, but ultimately in heaven. We're promised that in the scripture. And so we are reminded that every detail of our lives is important. And so we are called to live with deep wisdom and awareness. And that's really the struggle that the Pharisees had. They, they heard it. I mean, Jesus says it doesn't matter. I mean, somebody can come and tell, to see you from the dead. It's not going to change the way they, they live. We have everything available at our disposal. It really comes down to the choices that we make. And so, be aware of the choices of our lives. Struggle with the choices. We heard last week, and Glory, that was a tough sermon that you had to preach on last week. Way to go. That was really good. We heard about that shrewd manager that was like really confusing, but the bottom line is that we, we have what it needs and we have what it takes. We're called to live in congruent awareness of our actions. Second thing I'd like to look at is I'd like to suggest that we call ourselves Methodists. We are very methodical people. It doesn't matter where we are. Whether we're in Jamaica, we have a minister here from Jamaica in amongst us. Jean is a minister from Jamaica. Whether we're in South Africa, whether we are in America, whether we are in England or in Korea, Methodists are methodical. It's the most phenomenal thing. Quite disciplined people. And, and you know what the central theme of Methodism is? It's to spread scriptural holiness. So in fact, if you do not come and be uncomfortable in church, we've not really heard the gospel. Like, don't kick me out yet, all right? <laughs> to be holy in all things and to spread scriptural holiness, we have to struggle with scripture. So because we have to struggle with the chasms, the divides, the unbridgeable spaces that take us into a place of our choices, we also have to deal with the gaps that are in our heart. The gaps that exist in our heart. What are they? What, what in your heart is, is unsettled? Cynthia Bourgeau says something. She speaks about the parables of Jesus almost, and she compares it. She says, the parables of Jesus are like hand grenades that go off in our minds. They disrupt the conventional, conditional patterns of our lives. They disrupt the conventional conditioned patterns, and they call us to be new and renewed all the time. So this parable disrupts the pattern, but it, it does seem when Jesus tells this parable that it's, the, it's a little bit like the Jewish people would have understood. It was like a midrash, it was a story. It almost feels like it's a folklore because they almost know the story, but the truth is we all know the story. This is a story we all know. We have all seen it. We have lived it. The agony of poverty and riches. We, we, we know the story. And none of us want to be in this place where, where we find that there is nothing we can do about it. That's, that's the thing that we struggle with the most. It's, that's where we become desperate in the story. But you can see, but, but please, go, go and send someone. I've got five brothers. The desperation, the distance, that's like it's an impossible divide. Is there a moment, and we struggle with this. You know, this is a great turn or burn sermon. You know, we have, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's like, but it's really not about that. It's really about dealing with where in our heart, allow your heart to be exploded 
by this parable. Don't be defensive in its discomfort because it opens us up to a new possibility. The, the, the Hebrew word for hell is Gehenna in this passage, Gehenna, which is really a, a, the historical rubbish dump outside Jerusalem. There was a historical rubbish dump. That's where they actually think Jesus was crucified, at Gehenna. Outside, we will often find that our choices can actually put us outside. And so sometimes we all know what it's like to be outside, to be not part of that, the, the, the group, to be outside, to be forced into a place where, where we are isolated. And really what Jesus wants us to do is he wants us to deal with the, with the places in our hearts that really are disrupted. And we all have them. We all have different ones. I have loved having Helen come and visit me. So I met Helen 25 years ago when we arrived. I was just entering um, the ministry and I prayed to God for a friend. Has anybody ever prayed to God for a friend? It's a very special thing to pray to God for a friend. And when God gives you a friend, like they become special in your life. And I was like, I want a special friend. And I'd never really prayed for a friend before. And the first friend I met was Helen. So I decided, well, she's the one God sent me. Um, you know, and, it's, and we had children of similar ages. We talk a lot. And we jabber, 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 jabber the last couple of days so much. I've cried lots with her. She, she, you know, but the thing, the thing that I've loved is that she has been a witness for all my life for the last 25 years. And I can be vulnerable with her. Really, there's no point in us actually not being vulnerable with one another. Somehow we have learned a behavior in the church that has conditioned us no longer to be vulnerable, to actually be brokenhearted with each other. And so there's something in this particular parable that allows us to see the vulnerability of our humanity. It is good to have a witness to your life. It is good that our hearts are weighed. It's good. It's a good thing. This doesn't come with shame, but it comes with an invitation for transformation. It also comes with a warning that some of us will actually live life and we will actually not resolve the choices and and there will be a discomfort for us on the other side. It, it, there will be. Now, in the true sense, this Gehenna is really a place where, where, where the, the burning flames expressed here are really a historical marker to deal with what needs to ultimately be dealt with in our lives. It's almost the, 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 the flames that separate, that burn, the, and separate the chaff from the wheat. It's that kind of sense. Jesus wants the Christian world, the followers, to know that this is a faith that is serious, that demands my all. We've all sung that hymn. The truth is we live in a world where there are more Lazaruses than there are the rich man. We know that a third of the world subsists in less than $2 a day. We know that 16% of the global economic output in the world is owned by, listen to this, 0 0.0000, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 6%. This life really is not heaven. But, but our eyes and our hearts are called to heaven. And that's really what I want to say in conclusion today. This, this parable calls us to conversion. It calls us to the places that real liberation, real freedom, real comfort comes 
when we ultimately share the kingdom of heaven on earth. I know that you all believe that the decisions that we make, the people that we are becoming now, are the people who we will be in heaven. I know you know that, right? And so there is, as part of what this gospel message does, it really says you are living heaven on earth. You are living eternity today in the way you allow the power of the Gospels to transform your lives. We are a resurrection people. We are a resurrection people, and we don't, we don't end it with this great chasm. I am so happy that next week we get to celebrate communion. Because nothing separates us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. For he has laid his life down for you and for me. And we are called to live consciously, aware, but we are also called to be lived out in and through the presence of Christ. Allow God to do disruptive work in your soul and your heart this week. And come next Sunday to celebrate how profoundly loved you are. Let us pray together. Some of us know the, the flames of hell. In fact, some of us have lived them on earth. We know, Lord God, that some of us here have had our hearts crushed and our hopes destroyed. Some of us even watching the service today have more money than we are sure what to do with. And we keep walking away like the rich man. And so God, we invite you to weigh our hearts. Weigh our hearts We also thank you that we have Jesus. And we don't leave here today without that. And so we pray that the power and presence of Jesus Christ would heal the sores, would rebuild hope, would liberate the oppressed, would comfort the agony, and would keep setting us on a path where the kingdom of heaven is revealed on earth. Make us brave enough to encounter your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.